Greetings and welcome back everyone. This is Into the Nexus, the podcast all about heroes of the storm. I am back and I am still Garrett, here as always, with Kyle Ferguson. It's good to have you still, Garrett. (laughs) It's good to be back, man. I had the most relaxing election week of my life. It was excellent. Yeah, a little vacation at the same time. That's nice. It's it is nice. It's nice to get away, Kyle. In a year yeah. where that is a very strange thing to even think about. Well, how uh, how has the game been treating you now that you're back? I suck. <laughs> <laughs> Tur- yeah. Turns out, Kyle, lose it. yeah, it turns out like a week away. That's all it takes. That's all it takes for your uh, some of your 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 mouse hand muscle memory. To uh, make a mess of things. Mm, mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not all to, bad, you though. I, I had a treat. I got, I got, I got a treat. You gave, you, gave, you, you, you treated me to a wonderful little experience this week. Yeah. You let me fill in uh, for one of your games. I mean, I realized I was like doing you a favor. You would have been boned without me, which is why oh, not, we, we would have been. Yeah, I'm not thanking you luck, too much. Absolutely. Because yeah. without me, without Just me. Out of water. Yep. And my oh. hero that you forget about because you never see me. <laughs> Uh, and we we appreciate you showing up, filling in for a practice night. We got what uh, five storm leagues in together while we were working on comps, figuring out our stuff. I believe that's the case, and I believe we ended in the positive. I think it was three two. We ended, yeah, something like that. It was it, it got rough towards the end. It was we, front uh, and back stacks, so we led with the wins and we ended with the losses. So you know, you usually end on the losses, it's just like ah, bummer. But like, well, you know, it happens. Well, Kyle, it happens. There's a lot of there's a lot of learning going on over on that team. Uh, we had our first Heroes le- Lounge match last night, and we did win it, which was very encouraging. Mm-hmm. And mostly our practice this week was about breaking down our very high-tier coach players on the team, like Cavalier Guest, like Porky, to understand what is capable of Diamonds, Plats, and our gold healer. And that's, that's tough. I-, I respect that. Like, taking your mind out of CCL, out of these pro play tournament areas where things like Medivh and Cassia and you know, Chromie and Cassia and Chromie are still good, but they are paramounts of damage. That's not going to work here. We got to respect what this team is capable of. And thanks to you joining that night, we were able to break down those barriers and get a win in our actual tournament play last night. Sick, man. That's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have a feeling, Kyle, and you, you give me your give me your temperature on this. I have a feeling that on this episode, we're gonna, we're going to talk a lot about taking your head out of the CCL. A, a little bit, right? It is fascinating how fast it had a reaction. It, it's awesome. We're back to what feels like sort of HTC days when it comes to Storm League. People are making teams they see on the Twitter and the Twitch and the Heroes Profile slash CCL and all that sort of thing. And they're really, really tough. They are an artifact of medallion. There is a drive to create three melee teams nonstop, and I hate them. <laughs> I, I, oh, my. As, as a tank, it is just a horrible experience. As a bruiser, it's a great experience. Because I've been playing with the Gilly Sharks for their NGS games. And when they put together three melee, I'm just another melee. It's perfectly, I, I run in, I do bruiser things, I peel for the dude who's doing the one range guy business, doing all the carrying, as it were. In that regard, you know, as much as you carry and here's the storm. The one getting the damage and the kills out, right? But I'm just part of the sea of CC madness. And it's very easy to do that from the bruiser role. But in the tank role... To suddenly have Storm League and all these other teams that I'm playing with want to just make three melee comps and one carry, as it were. It is a brutal lesson. And I don't know how to play with it. Because my goal as tank with two range DPS is to live. I'm going to live for as long as possible, and you will kill things. Three melee comps are more like we're going to go in and we're going to and we're going to kill something really fast or we all need to run the hell away. And running away in a video game is very hard. Yeah. But this is all a result of the medallion. Because if I make a good setup as a tank with CC, if I get somebody, 
my two ranges follow up and we kill and we have the damage to do this. But we've entered not only HGC times where we have CC stacking, which is very, very effective. We're in medallion times, which means the CC must be perfectly stacked, perfectly followed up. And that's why we're seeing the rise of things like right wing and Stukov. Because uh, there's no answer. You can't hit medallion. Also, uh, or you, you, you just go with a, a type of CC that the medallion has no effect on in Tomb. Seeing Leo but, or Nathimbo's zombie wall, right? Like yeah. Nathimbo's having a bit of a comeback because you cannot medallion out of that sort of CC. And you were there for one of these games. And I feel like it was a really deciding factor. Granted, I, I have to admit, I kind of have other people's voices in my head. Like Fury Hots was tweeting this week about how much he hates medallion. It's all over. Everyone's talking about how much they hate medallion at the moment. But we made a wombo combo of the century. It was Zeratul time stop, Gazlo gravity bomb, uh, Circle for Jaina, Diablo Apoc. And we couldn't hit the darn combo because when we landed it perfectly, that happened to be once every five minutes. <laughs> and they would all walk out. They would all have all their heroics, which were dirty and messy and weren't following up each other in this beautiful way like we were. But it didn't matter because on the other side of this, they had all their heroics and they won those fights. Yeah, after the fact, I, I, I haven't gone back and, and, and reviewed the replay. But after the fact, I was kind of thinking to myself, I was like, it's almost like they the only time they were ever in a position to even get comboed was when their medallion was off cooldown. Right. And it's, it's having those reverberating effects. There are, as I mentioned, the, the Stukovs and you mentioned the Leorks who are succeeding in this time period, but people like my, my personal favorite, you know, Diablo, sure. It's, it's uh -huh. been a long time since I've been able to do a APOC charge combo because if I APOC under your feet, push you off with the charge, you're going to medallion. I'm not going to be able to pick you up and that APOC was wasted. So that's been a little disappointing, but you know, not, not a huge deal uh, while making my way through Diamond. But now that I'm in that Diamond 1 territory fighting Masters, the number of mistakes that are made throughout a game are so few that they make a mistake every what? Five minutes? And then that mistake doesn't turn into a kill. And so my play has suffered. And people like my other favorite, Malganus, who is like, oh, I'm going to get you. Like, it's, that's, that's ultimately the problem with him right now. It's He's like, you're very go. telegraphed. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get one swipe, two swipe. And then with like the count three swipes and you're stunned. It, it, they're, they're medallion on the third or they see me wanting to sleep them and they medallion out and everything gets ruined. And I really didn't have an issue with it until the CCL started up and I got to that higher rank. And now, now I've got to say, Ooh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of taxed. I'm kind of not enjoying the tank role so much at the moment. My picks aren't equaling things. Yeah, dude, I, you know, I, so I was in those games with you and, and, and I was in that one very particular game where we had, we should have had wombo combos for days. It should have been a beautiful thing. Um, and, and it was spoiled and I was like, okay, yeah. All right. I kind of, I see where you and your team are, are coming from on the, on the medallion front, but I was still, I was still, there's a glimmer of glimmer of medallion hope in the back of my mind. It was like, I see where you're coming from. Good points. But, you know, I, I, it's still, I still find it somewhat interesting. I find it particularly interesting in CCL right now. Um, could and will mostly wear out its welcome, you know, if the, the meta stays the same for too long, but, but that's neither here nor there. But my personal point of breakage and completely coming over to your side of the, of the, I think I'm done with medallion team is, uh, I was like, all right, but the, the, I, you know, I, I dusted myself off. I'm like, but th that was, that was, that was coordinated play. You know, it was five stack versus five stack. I'm going to go, I'm going to go play by myself, you know, and, uh, we wanted to get back on Kerrigan, Kyle. So I played like mm, one, I played mm -hmm. one Kerrigan game. I played one. I was like, this is going to be so much fun. Kerrigan's doing great right now. Let's do it. Every combo. Every combo. You know, you try it on five different people and five different times they hit the damn medallion. You're just like, you son of a... <laughs> quick match. <laughs> it's... Right, and there is, you know, a lot of wiggle room there and that, well, you should be able to combo faster than every five minutes. But as you said, you pick different targets each time. You may have soaked those medallions. Like the, the comps that tournament players are putting together 
are a lot like the comps we saw back in the day in HGC. Stun stacking is extremely powerful. The interesting thing about it is that we've changed the characters out. We don't lead with a root anymore into that stun. We lead with polymorphs. We lead with silences. We lead with sleeps. Things that can't be medallioned out. So it's really restricting down the team comps. And to suddenly enter this world where, and we're going to talk about the CCL a little more intensely later, where the carries aren't the carries we used to have. It's really hard to tell what the damage output and that flow of combat is going to look like. Uh, the, and it, yeah, I think a big exception there is Vala. You know, Vala's kind of seeing a bit of a resurgence. Sure, like you give me, you give me into this three melee comp with gray main. I mean, gray main. Oof, that's I don't really like it. That's that's too many melee. I I know we, I I don't tend to belabor that point in my own league. I often think it's ridiculous when I see gold leagues and whatnot being like, we have nothing but magic damage. We're going to, it's all spell damage. Our team sucks. Or we're nothing but sustain. We have to have a burst and a sustain. We have too many melee. Like, I, I don't normally think of it an issue. But because the types of CCs we're running, you're just so vulnerable to it. And you have to do it faster than the enemy side. And so Vala, Vala's okay. But Greymane in that, whoo. And then you got something like a Rhaegar running around too, and you're just like, I have no idea how this team functions. <laughs> how do we complete a kill when yeah. they get two feet away from us? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I feel you, man. I feel you. I'm doing, I, I'm, I'm back to doing some soul searching in this game. I don't know. I think I'm, uh, I'm feeling pretty down on solo laning at the moment. Outside of coordinated play. Love it. Love it. You, you give me a call. You're like, oh, I need to fill. I need, we need you to come in, fill in for us. I'm like, yeah, we get to go do it. But man, pickup games, like even if I'm like doing with a buddy, like what's the point? My buddy's off doing something else. We're not together. We're not coordinating. Like, uh, just, I don't know. I, I need to, I need to put it. I think I need to put it to bed. I think I need to get over watching the solo lane not be done correctly by some rando on my team. That's fair. On. I mean, there's also other solo laners that are powerful right now. It's been a pretty big switch up. Diva really brought in that because Diva has a counter to Zul in the fact that she can defense Matrix his lane clear. It's a 50% cut to the damage, and the damage that's being dealt turns into bomb power for you. So every time Zul goes to clear a lane, you say, no, you're not. Beep, yeah. beep, 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 beep. All the beeps happen. Diva gets power from it, and then she wins that lane. And with Zul already having counters like... Yeah, Sonya, not so much some of the other double soakers like uh, Malthiol or Leoric and whatnot, but it's been a very big shakeup. And Gazlo is very powerful and super fun, but also a delayed stun that kind of plays into this medallion world we have right now. So yeah. we've got three weeks left in the season. Is it going to disappear? Will it be adjusted? Will they bake it in? I don't think that's the the popular idea right now. I don't think people are ready to say medallions forever. It's interesting, man. Like th th I think there's, there's obviously there's room to tweak it. Um, I think the one that concerns me the most is like just saying it's here to stay as is. Um, and it's and like, not because I can't see it working. It's just that I see to me, I think if it's going to stay as is forever, like let's just, let's just play around in that reality for a second. Uh, it's that I think, we're going to have to adjust for it. Um, and like overall, dude, like I've been really happy with the direction that the team's been like pushing the game over the last year. Like basically since post HGC, it's been really cool for someone who's more interested in what the game is like for me, an average Joe who just wants to play some games and, and less so for coordinated play. Um, I've really, really enjoyed it. That said, there's the speed at which they adjusted to some of their more overarching changes like movement speed. We're still seeing them adjust things based on movement speed. I think it's taken mm -hmm. a little bit too long. I wish they had been a little more heavy handed with how they compensated for it with some of this stuff. And so in that regard, like if they, if it turns out that medallion is here to stay as it is, my, my hope is that they're a little more fast and furious with adjusting elsewhere because yeah, you're right, man. Like I'm with you. I'm and, and you know, you know, I mean it cause I don't like Malganis and I don't want him tanking for me. I like Malganis has had the wind taken out of his wings to, to make it on brand. Like that's a hero that if medallion is here permanently needs to be adjusted. 
needs to have less of a wind up on some of those crowd control abilities. And that's, that's, and that, and there's so many other heroes like that, that I, I think if medallion becomes permanent, that's something we need to look at. Like how long is the wind up on these things? And so I, I think, you know, I look at Gazo and I go, okay, no wonder, no wonder his explodium explodes faster. It's almost seems like it was made with medallion in mind. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. But there's a ton of heroes where it's not. And Malganus is a great example of that. Giving Diva a stun on her charge kind of seems like a crazy S of Joe kind of thing that shouldn't be on her kit. Diva, give Diva stuns? That's that's wild. But what are you maybe doing? in this world. Yeah. yeah, maybe in this post medallion sort of it, you know, that might be giving too much credit. I don't know if they're like, we're gonna medallion for fun. And then by the way, we need to rework these reworks we're doing to make sure they function in the post medallion world. Yeah. I don't think that's true. There is a, it's, it's so double-sided when it comes to the CCL and tournament play, because on the one hand, they're going to do this anyway. They want to CC stack. We might not see Brightwing as popular as she is right now because other heroes like Malfurion could do a job of starting that CC stack, locking somebody down and helping get a kill. But right now we need the silence. We need a full blown. You can't press that button button. Would they create the same exact comps with more options? Maybe. That's not bad, though. The idea that these comps would be more diverse, more interesting. Right, right. Yeah, I, like, I, I I, think for a lot of us, and myself included, like, the inclination is naturally go to, like, critique mode. Something is wrong, so it's the wrong way to do it. Let's just undo it. But so often, when we hear from the devs, how many times have they told us? Often, there's multiple right answers, and we're not sure. It's, it's an imperfect science, and I think they're right. So... You know, they, they, to me, I try to focus on what's interesting and not so much right and wrong. And I, I, I fail at that a lot, but I'm, I'm trying with medallion to be like, well, what's interesting. What's, what's a less obvious route we could go than just no, turn it off, take it away. We're done with it. Well, look, let's look at someone like Imperius main tank Imperius. That's mm -hmm. happening quite a bit in our home games too. Is it his ability to be snappy that it's a full blown stun? It hits multiple people. And in the blink of an eye, it happens. Like, if you're ETC out there, and your job is to interrupt Imperius, it's going to be hard to hit that face melt in time. That's a heavy skill. Bright wings across the entire game are being asked to interrupt the stun itself. Either he's in transit, or you polymorph him on connect so it breaks the channel that's going on mechanically, and then he can't do the auto attack with the flash of anger on the other side. That's a really important skill that... Our home bright wings haven't adapted to. That's your responsibility, bright wing. Not so much my job on ETC. I got a lot of other jobs to do. But before the medallion, before main tank Imperius, when he first started coming in, my thought was, oh, he's just got this, this, this shield thing is too big. The reason he's being run as main tank is because the shield is really, really large. And if we just shrink that down a little bit on his level 10, we won't be seeing this main tank Imperius anymore. We'll solve the issue. So. As you said, multifaceted. Uh, I don't, I, there's a lot of adaptations I don't want for the medallion. I don't want to see once a game that would be just as disappointing for the few mistakes that are happening when you get in Masters League range. That one mistake that the one player makes that one Hanzo jumps or that Lunara lands against a wall and still gets out, that's too much. I think that a short range teleport would be way more interesting. Uh, granted, you know, then we enter a whole nother pile of issues like melees can now go over walls all the time. You know, how far is the short range teleport? Can they use it to close a gap? Does a certain heroic suddenly become hugely viable because you can adjust your position? But you could make it more aggressive plays out of it. And that's, I think, the greatest sadness I've seen out of the medallion is it's not long enough, and I don't want it to be longer, but it's not long enough to empower your engagement to make you run all the way through that route, all the way through that maze done and access something else. Mm. So it's always reactionary. It's always defensive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, like it, 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 the, the part of my brain that understands and kind of agrees with like, maybe, maybe it's run its course and, and we remove it, remove it is, uh, just coming back to that kind of the, the multi-layered facets of how many damn things we need to keep track of in this game already. Like this totally. Is a, this is a MOBA that has 
not only more than one map, but a ton of maps that you need to worry about on top of everything that's unique about a hero. So, and there's also something about it that, I don't know, there's a part of me that also is, doesn't like homogenized abilities, but that, that I don't, that's not an argument. That's not as strong of a personal argument for me. Like I don't feel as strongly about that one, but for some reason you made me think of it with your short range teleport. I'm like, I don't want everyone to have a short range teleport. I like that. Only some people have access to that. And it's at level 20. Yeah. Yeah. In that case where you like the few times I've used bolts of the storm on ETC, it is hugely impactful. It's almost never defensive. I love Hellgate. Hellgate is awesome on Diablo. That's a very unique with a with a stun circle, right? Like that's really, really interesting and really unique. Uh, Sylvanas's I, I don't use too much. Thralls is super rare to be picked up. Kerrigan's got one, but I think it's pretty rare. Uh, I think it actually might be the most picked. I was looking at it earlier. Don't, no, another Kerrigan's like a little Kerrigan's low, little low shock in the area. Games played. Maybe it's just the highest win rate. No, it's the most picked. Okay. Yep. 58% popularity. Helps you close the distance. I get it. Yep. I get it. Yep. Also, it uh, looks like it, it and Torask are like neck and neck for level 20 win rate for Kerrigan. So. Yeah, I wasn't aware Psionic Shift had a 60% pick rate, though. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Generates 300% increased assimilation shields. Well, I, I guess visually as a tank, it... My brain isn't like, wait, Kerrigan just moved a, a, in a space without walking there? How, how I need to register this in my brain real quick. Oh my goodness, this is really important to me. When she's constantly going, ha, 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 and jumping around between random things. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's like that kind of, to me, it's kind of special that something like that is, is available at level 20. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, this is just an example. I'm not saying this is what I want, but I, I like something almost a little more a little more generic, like, I don't know, like a speed boost or something on a long cooldown to me is a little more interesting because you can still, there's still counterplay there. So I that's fair. Know. It's interesting. Like it, it kind of feels like I'm ready to hear the team talk about the medallion again. Yeah. I want to see their results. What, what their internal stats to them look like, because we're feeling particularly with the CCL on, the changes and how teams have had to adjust. I want to know if we kept medallion, what that thought experiment would look like. I don't think they're going to, that's a really long road. Yeah. That's, that's like the DM coming to the play session being like, I plan two campaigns. This one, we're not going to play, but here's the story of it. No, <laughs> you, we're, they're probably not going to put a bunch of work into telling us what this other universe would have looked like. What speed boost space laser from our Tannis could have been due to movement speed change. They're just going to tweak it slightly, like we did with uh, Alex Straza. I like that, though. Uh, getting into that patch, as it were, but... So what I'm, like what I'm hearing they... is, is you haven't read uh, George Lucas's scrapped script for the Star Wars sequel trilogy. Is, is there such a thing? Yes. I... What? Uh, sequel as in... Oh, wait. Oh, oh, oh in, the ones that like, they made recently. Instead of Force Awakens through Rise of Skywalker. Oh. Was it good? No. Probably not. No. no, probably not. Yeah. No. There's some interesting things, but it's it's weird. I mean, there's that disturbing footage of him exiting a writing room surrounded by people who are already making props and sets for the Phantom Menace and being like, it's done. And you're like, look at all the crud that's already been made for a thing that wasn't done yet. That's horrifying. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Welcome to the creative process uh, under one leader. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot like when you play with your friends and you're like, can you play, uh, let's pick something. Can you play Leoric? And, and they this go, just happened the other I, night. I was about to say, you're going to say Leoric because yeah. Forky asked me, hey, Garrett, can you play Leoric? And I was just like, no. Which is, I respect and I love you for it because a lot of people would say, I can. To me, it's like, no, no, <laughs> no, no, that's not how we do things. No, but I do have a question for you on that front later, but we'll wait until we get there. All right, let's go there. Yeah, let's, let's do Well, before we do, I want to thank those of you supporting us over at patreon.com slash ITN. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's an opt-in way to uh, subscribe and support Kyle and myself monetarily. I don't know if you know this, folks, but this is actually a big way that we actually 
make a living. This is our jobs. Um, so if you like this show and you like the content that we're making, uh, please go check out patreon.com slash ITN. Um, whatever works for you works for us. Every little bit helps. Uh, it helps us put a lot of time into making this show. So thank you for it, everyone. And uh, you'll get some perks like uh, access to our patron only discord and you'll get to sign up when we do our patron nights once a month, our, uh, our patron bonanzas. Kyle, did I see you put it to a vote that the next one and if the votes are any indication, are is going to be a ram instead of unranked? Yes, yeah, yeah. We're going to be doing an a ram. It looks like votes are in at three times for unranked. So we're off to a ram this time. You mean three times for? Yes, for A-Ram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People yeah. really want a ram. Yeah, it's. Uh, I guess it's going to happen. You know what my concern is? Is like game length, dude. Some of my a rams have been dumb long. Right, my first thought was, hey, Ram, oh, okay, there's no draft. Like, we can we can fit more games in an evening. Nah, we're going to keep it the same for this first go. Yeah. Just just to be sure. Yeah. Just to make sure. It's... it's we're gonna, everyone's going to go 30 minutes. It's going to be great. You're going you're gonna to have the... You remember, you remember when we used to have Tired Garrett on Bonanza Nights? I think we're going to mm-hmm. hit it again. I think we're going to hit it again. Hey, it, gonna be like, yeah. Garrett, what do you think? Oh, I don't know, man. What do you, I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, They gave me Morales. I'm just going to play the Morales. I, no, we already have two I support. Can't. Don't pick the Morales. Oh, it's, it's cool, man. It'll be okay. I'll go grenade build. I can't stream during a Ram. It's so to the action, uh, the amount of like travel time and like doing camps that I get to interact with chat. I love it. <laughs> I hate streaming a Ram because I'm so busy all the time. <laughs> There's no, no moment where I can breathe and think. Yeah, this is going to be fun, man. I'm looking forward to this. It's going to be, be a pretty yeah. good time. We switched things up over on the Angry Chicken for the last uh, tournament we did, and we did Battlegrounds instead of Standard. And, dude, that was so oh, nice. cool. It's it's fun to, to, to switch things up every once in a while. Yeah, I look forward to it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, anyways, let's, uh, let's, let's move into this week's Heroes of the Storm news. We're on, boys! <laughs> let's liven up this place! The moment is upon us. Yes, I'd mana tap that. So the dust is settling from a, 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 a sizable balance patch last week that uh, I wasn't here to talk about. So uh, you want you want rapid fire Garrett Garrett hot takes, Kyle? I sure do. All right, Kyle. So going through it. So you, you last week, you know, you did your your buffs, your nerfs, your retool slash rebalance. Um, so on the you know Malganus got buffed. I'm I'm gonna go with still now. Nah. That's a still now nah on Malganus. Yeah, I'd yeah. have to agree. Yeah, uh, mainly the medallion. It's keeping him down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wasn't on board even pre-medallion, but yeah, I agree. Uh, on the Haka, I like that they mentioned his lower win rate because he's been there for a while, and the Haka was kind of a, a, a special case for a lot of people. He doesn't really share uh, kit behavior with any other heroes, so if you go out of your way to learn him. You're you're putting a lot of effort there that can't really be translated elsewhere, so I'm glad that they're they're taking another look at Dahaka. Uh, Leoric, I'm I get really excited about base damage increases, Kyle. So uh, here I want to ask you: Is it time? Is it time that I learn Leoric? It could be time. What if they? Do you what like, what if next week they're like Medallion is gone? I think he'd still be in the same spot. He is a double soaker. He has some advantages against certain bruisers. My concern with you taking up Leoric would be that it can be very bummerific mm. when you miss your drain hope. Yeah, because I mean, that's, that's how, how I play win. against Leoric is just constantly strafing erratically. Right. And then you invest when he's on cooldown from that, which mm. if you miss, you basically go... Okay, I'll see you in 12 seconds. I'll be back later. You know, you win the lane for now. We'll try Whereas this again Sonya, in 12 seconds. Right, well, and, and Sonya, and I don't know if that's the actual uh, duration on that, just a guess, but uh, with Sonya, you missed your spear. You suck. But you can still spin. You can still slam. You can still walk straight towards them and auto-attack them decently. Uh, Sonya has so much recovery for his health that that isn't based on executing the spear though my goodness the amount of pressure you create by hitting that spear is huge that's how you actually win that solo lane yes it is not required to survive correct it's not it's not required to simply exist in the solo lane lyric has a really good rhythm with uh you know you, you, you double soak you soak you solo lane then you show up you entomb or you go for you know big meme energy and do your march of the black king going for level 20 
that can be very fun. You've now participated and you go back to solo lane. It's not as decisive as Malthiel because you have last rights. Malthiel shows up, bam, bim, bam, big kill. And then you ride up to that solo lane feeling like a champ. So basically what I'm saying, Gary, is I don't know if you can handle the ups and downs of Leoric. <laughs> he's, he's not a happy man. I respect that, that realistic response because that's kind of my concern. <laughs> Uh, Varian got buffed, but I mean, he's still Varian. Like, <laughs> Kyle, has Varian moved an inch for you in your, in where he lives in your mind? Because for me, he's still, uh, face roll when ahead and no chance when you're behind. I'd say that's pretty accurate. We saw some taunt Varian in the CCL recently, and it, encourage that sort of thought process to my memory. Well, you're I also think... seeing Stukov in CCL, so that makes sense. Yeah. Because that's yeah. horrendous. The biggest problem with Varian and Taunt Varian in particular is that he is weak to the counters we believe to be strong. Or he's weak at countering the things we believe he's good at, like Genji's and Tracer's. The charge time to reach those targets gives them time to react and get out. And you have Mendalion on top of it, not to belabor that point. Yeah. Uh, Varian actually has a uh, 100% win rate in the CCL right now with uh, three bands and, oh, one game played. Okay, never mind, never mind. Yeah, but they, there it is, there it is. So, but receiving bands is still interesting. Uh, what you actually use Varian for is for a wide ver a range of other taunt-like activities or combos. So at our home games, we're still not drafting him correctly. I think, too, you can easily get kited. Oh, without which a doubt. Might, yeah, which might be an issue worth looking at. I don't know how you'd fix it, though, because you don't want Fury and Colossal Smash Varian to be uh, going any faster. <laughs> that would be problematic. What if we made his charge faster, but it's a skill like line shot as opposed to a target your target? Or could we just make his charge faster? Would it be the worst thing in the world? Maybe. I mean, Blaze goes pretty fast. He has a windup. So I, I always like when they add in that counterplay moment. Mm -hmm. And I think the locking yourself out of abilities while charging I, is, is my guess of how it works because it always feels like if you do a shift command or something like that to get that taunt on the other side there's still that lingering moment where they can react that's all really healthy stuff yeah if i mean charge used to stun of course and that was a delightful good time but that was also what like four seconds of straight cc out of one character on release it was brutal yeah it was fun but yeah. yeah, no one wants to play in that world. No, no, they don't. Um, we spent a ton of time talking about Alex Straza when Kai Berries was here. Uh, and she got, you know, they buffed the range of some of her abilities last week. Was, But after our conversation with Kai Berries, because I got to say, Alex Straza was not a hero. I had spent a lot of time thinking about. I, I can't help but look at these changes and go, was, was range the problem? No. So... The change is actually rather interesting. Basically, when they did the movement speed change, if you were to cast that circle at max range, you would run over it by the time you got there. So this is a like it just a feels good kind of change where if you cast now max range, it goes further. You have more range, which is a nice buff. But if you run at full speed, you will still be in that circle when you get there. And that's nice. And I like that sort of adaptation to the movement speed change. Over things like maybe Ravenous Spirit and Space Laser Artanis that didn't need as much attention or the quality of life felt bad, but we didn't need to buff them for those reasons. So very healthy. Alex Straza, 0% participation in the CCL, though. There are healers that are doing way more, way better CC, uh, enabling teams better. Also, Kyle, you want some statistics? Mm. Her win rate is down since the last patch. Well, we can always kind of chalk that up to, well, people got curious. They thought she was buffed. I think that she's just a circle maker in a circle world of MOBAs. And <laughs> I don't really know how you 
change that. Like, like we could even go crazy into like Alarak Town and be like, it's not a circle, it's a trapezoid. <laughs> yeah, it's a square, it's a star, you know, it, like adding other shapes onto it would actually cause more decision making for the Jaina Blizzard or the May Blizzard, both named Blizzard. Or Junkrat Bombs, or, and that's the other, like, when we get right down to it, too. Junkrat, Medivh, Chromie, even Cassia are the top, top carries for these CCL games and are becoming our top carries in our home games. You're not going to say stand here against anybody who's doing that kind of AoE damage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th- then the buff the false dead Hinterlands Blast seemed strange to me. That I, yeah, I think it is. I think it is strange. Uh, yeah, because I, I, I when I see false dads, I feel like I'm just spending the entire game dodging a Tulin's blast. <laughs> so like increasing that cooldown reduction, it's just like eh, I don't know about that. Of all the changes, I think this was the one for the tournament play. This was them saying, we know you all want Mighty Gus. Can I interest you in Hinterland Blast? <laughs> and the answer is no. Fair. Does kind of feel that way, doesn't it? Uh, that's so, uh, fine. I think Hinterland Blast is very powerful. Wins are random and bad in Storm League. It's coordinated, yeah. You, that's what you need. That's what you need for your cute gusts. Yeah. Even uh in any sort of game you play with people, there's always going to be that, oh, I had that kind of moment. Well, I was going to catch that ball. And Mighty Gust uh, always yeah. leaves somebody disappointed. Or there's also the other horrible, horrible thing that could happen, which we've all accidentally gone on the ride, when you select somebody with a Kerrigan jump, a Varian charge, a Diablo charge, whatever it is, and they get Mighty Gusted or Sukab pushed, and your character goes... Woo! <laughs> rides the ride yep. onto the other side of the map. That's that's the pits, man. At least if it's varying, it's, sl- it's a slow movement out there. <laughs> yeah, and you get to listen to that that boar sound, you know, that you all know and love for an uh-huh. extra second. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Uh. Why do spider? Yeah, it's, the spiders still bother me. It's, I've never heard a spider hiss, and World of Warcraft spiders always hiss. You, you got to give them some sort of sound, man. I guess so. Like you know. They're just I, I like so, in real scale. life, they're just so small you can't hear it. If they were as big as they are in World of Warcraft, you would hear it. Maybe they are always hissing. That's a good point. Which, in comparison, they must hate crickets who are loud as hell. <laughs> I don't know. It probably, uh, probably keeps some things that would eat spiders at night away from them because they're so obvious targets. Maybe they, yeah, maybe they eat crickets, so they're happy with it. Yeah, I mean, dude, if I was out, if we were both stuck out in the in the wilderness and wolves were hunting us, I would not be complaining that you were making a racket. <laughs> as long as skeletons still click in video games, I'm happy because I love the rattles. <laughs> yes. So, um, all right, before we leave the buffs from last week, am I insane that I actually want to take mind control on Sylvanas now that it's down to 40 second cooldown. I think you're slightly insane, maybe a little sick, but every 40 seconds and every 15 seconds at level 20. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's level 20, man. Yeah. I, we had, we had, we we had a famous, we power spike at 16 game together this week uh, where it took us way longer than it should have to get to 16 and the things didn't go well. No, I, I think in the end, of course, it's obvious to say Wailing Arrow is doing what Mind Control does better in an AoE. There are so many worlds where Mind Control could become powerful, and I agree that that's at the salt wall, and I think the team agrees with that too. Because you could do just ridiculously awesome things like Splash. That'd be insane, of course, to compete with Wailing Arrow's Splash. You could do uh, you know, a dagger sort of system where... When you hit the mind control target, it spreads out slows or stuns or even the mind control in, in, in the area around it. Maybe it, what if we took like a, what, what's a, what's a talent nobody likes here? Uh, let's see. Overwhelming affliction is 15% pick rate. Uh, mercenary queen. That's not really what I'm thinking about. Maybe, maybe lost soul. Like what if mind control also helped 
you get stacks on Furling Shadows at level one. Wouldn't mind it. I wouldn't mind it. I just think mind control is getting down into that low enough cooldown area where it's a consideration. Yeah. And, and it is. To go any further. I, I, think, I think I'm paying attention because I think any shorter than this is insane. I think if we go to 35 seconds or 30 seconds, that we all just start taking it. Because then it's not as scary when you miss. It's not as big of a feels bad when you miss. Sadly, you have to remove your brain from the 1v1 potential of it. Because the wailing arrow also silences the support that would cleanse. The tank that would peel. So when you land that sweet mind control, the counterplay is still available by the rest of the team to help that target. Mm. You know what isn't available? Mm. Medallion. For that person, right? <laughs> and the other people's but, medallion doesn't help them. <laughs> but yeah, but, and, but you could also say that now nobody on the team can use a medallion. And if we're not targeting the right target, or at least your mind control target, they're all silenced and not medallion. Uh, so just really just messing with you a little bit. No, I, yeah, and, and I understand your desire. I think it's a very cool idea. Uh, I, I certainly don't want to see... I want to see this continued with the idea about the slow, the three stacks. I want the walking towards Sylvanas. That's all really, really cool. I wouldn't even mind if we buffed via missile control or anything like that. Like, uh, it'd be really sweet if Sylvanas did basically a Leoric Wraith walk and her soul ejected out of her body and, and flew around and the first person it touches, that's your mind control target. Ooh, but what I don't want to see cool. is see, I, I don't want to see mind control ever touch my abilities. I've been a priest in PvP WoW. I've jumped you off clips before. I've stolen your cooldowns. Not in a MOBA, please. <laughs> I think that's fair. I think that's fair. We could just play with the projectile speed. Is a really obvious thing that they could tweak. Yeah, but but they piqued my interest with with a with a heroic that I have multiple times on this show, and then just have thought to myself, Sylvanas. We've seen more interesting things out of this character in fiction. Like let's let's just replace it with a more interesting heroic. But like we've I'm, try, moved, I'm trying to give it the benefit of the doubt. No, we've moved a very far away from Warcraft 3 Sylvanas, whose mind control was absurdly powerful. In my opinion, the easiest way to beat the hard AI shows where I kind of spent my time <laughs> playing the PvP version. But they fly in a bunch of frost worms. You bought Sylvanas in the tavern. You mind control a chimera, frost worm, whatever. That's a really big move in Warcraft 3 in a game that moves real slow. Yeah. <laughs> so so what, what, I'm, what I'm saying to you is that to some people, that is an essential part of Drow, Banshee Queen, whatever, you know, the, these off versions, the, uh, the, the, the knockoff versions of the heroes you would get in Warcraft 3. But I also agree that like her shooting tendrils or even chains everywhere sounds like it makes more sense today. Yep. Or becoming an actual Banshee, considering Banshee Queen is in her damn name. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that, that always didn't make a lot of sense, but she was a banshee and then became corporeal. I yeah, I did, yeah, she wasn't, it was like they weren't intending to use her, but then they're like, oh, well, you know, we kind of like this character. Let's keep it going for Frozen Throne. But they were also making World of Warcraft at the same time. So, and then, the, then that whole company switched from, you know, making video games to being a service industry. So who who knows? Who indeed. Uh, on the nerf front, uh, D.Va, I'm still just waiting for them to do something about the missile damage. <laughs> this just where my feel bad against that hero lives. It hurts, oh, chat man. says she's possessing her own body. So she was a ghost and she's mind controlling her previous I mean, if corpse. I remember the lore correctly, yeah, like it's a big deal that she essentially reclaims her body. That's metal. That's gross. Dude, Savannah's is awesome. 
Yeah, that's it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, wicked. I, I, I'm with you about the so so Diva was correctly targeted for high end play. That particular talent they went after was the right one to target. I agree with you that mini missiles are very damaging. I still feel like the slow is a little too much. Uh, counterplay is available if not in a choke though and I have been reacting better to the missiles given more time and actually playing D.Va on the NGS team has taught me a lot of D.Va's weaknesses yeah which which, which that, that's a hard thing much like the medallion it's a hard thing to reward your brain on you see a infernal shrines objective pit let's say everyone has five skulls no big deal or pumpkins, as I was told they were called in the tournament scene. Not sure why, but that's what I was told. So it's a very even pit. Diva comes running, she's got a bomb, and you burn through Diva, but she still activates that bomb. Damn, now they're at 15. My brain says, curses. Diva and her bomb. She gave herself another health bar. That's, that's cheap. I feel cheated. But in reality, we burned the bomb at a bad time for D.Va. It didn't have the impact during the time she wanted, which would be later on in that objective. We all need to go, hooray, we did it. <laughs> we, we got it. We got a kill on the mech. I mean, yeah, you're, you are removing a part of D.Va's utility. Yeah. And even though she gets right back in it because she bombed, we're already winning that scenario because the bomb threat is gone in a time that we were in control of it. But so so is your it. simple tip, pressure the diva? Pre yeah, exactly. Try to, so you don't not target the diva when she's close to a bomb. You actually burn her down and make her use a bomb right as she gets it in a time she wouldn't want to use it in the first place. Mm. And that's a tough sell because it doesn't feel good. But much like Hanzo going over wall, we can all be like, there goes Hanzo. He's on cooldown, everybody. Like, Johanna burns skin. She's got no iron skin. Get her. Like, it, 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 instead, we're all our brains saying, aw, he got away. Johanna got away. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair, man. And, I, and she can double soak at range, and she's good against Zul. So she has a very real place in every game right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as far as the gasoline nerfs, what do, what do you think my opinion is? Um, you know, I haven't read this yet. So I would say you're a little sad they went after your main build, but you still think he's great. <laughs> my my reaction is fair. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think Gazzo was overperforming like across the board. Um, the only one that hurts kind of is big game hunter like it, it feels like it takes forever to get scrap back now because of what they how they changed that um but i think you still i think you still do like the shield turret build more often than not even though they nerfed that talent as well yeah rocket socket is just so on demand once you get used to it it's it's just really nice yeah yeah um, and then at 13, uh, overcharge capacitors has been competitive the entire time. It's just been underpicked. So I, I think, uh, if you're, if you're bummed about schematics getting nerfed, just take a look at capacitors. So. I do think it's interesting that Gazlos are compensating for the feeling of big game hunter by flocking to goblin fusion at level seven in droves at the moment. Oh, is that because we all want that. more scrap. And Goblin Fusion gives us that scrap. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, th that's been the most picked talent for a while, like before the nerf. That was still leading the picks. Um, I believe it. So, yeah, it, which which is that that is a that's a well stacked talent tier because overload is so appealing to me because it's like it's that's your self healing. Like yeah. the laser is how you survive. Now rocket socket helps because you're getting the shield, but there's still a big chunk of healing to be had through actually landing your your laser. Um, so to me, I still I, I just like I don't know. It's like we, we don't talk about this a lot, but there's there's something to be said I think for stacking talents uh, or talent tiers in a way that is 
legitimately a hard decision to make. And uh, that's they. I think they really accomplished that with with Gaslow. I agree. I think uh, the time between so without Rocket Socket, I wouldn't be as interested in. Oh man, that's kind of a it's, 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 it, yeah. It is a it gives a good sw- split. What are you talking about? Because if you get more scrap, you're dropping more shields. But I really like having shields while I channel my two charges with overload because now I'm taking care of my own health and not, regenerating yeah, it under those shields. They're not necessarily bad to take to like you, you, overload with rocket socket is not bad for the reason you just mentioned. It feels like you should take hyper focus coils because it increases the damage you deal and the healing amount you're healed for if you're going overload, which again makes sense. And that's why I'm, this is what I'm talking about. Like these talent tiers are so well designed. They are difficult decisions to make. But funny uh, that what we've, we've, we've just declared is rather elegant design that we've moved so far away from match all the pictures. Because we still have a lot of players who match all the pictures, and if they don't match, that's not a build. But by investing in different areas of Gazlo, you shore up his weaknesses and make a more complete character rather than one that is entirely based on one thing, one job, one trick. Exactly. I, I just find that I find that so interesting. Also, just just keep taking bomb toss, everybody. It's slowly pulling ahead in pick rate, and it is so far ahead in win rate. It's insane. It's noisy. It's good. It's, it is uh, good. It is good. It's a good level 20 turnaround talent. Yeah. Speaking of 20s and Uberak, um, everyone's still taking rewind, Kyle. I believe it. Anubarak is still sneaking up in popularity a little bit. I actually picked him this past week as well. Uh, he's... Well, he's he's having showings in CCL as well. On top yeah. of getting new 20s, which I'm sure peaks, peaked interest in the player base. So um, I wouldn't... His, he, he did lose some some win percentage in the past uh, since the patch. But I, I think it's twofold. I think it's probably seeing him in the CCL and uh, the adjustments to his 20s. Playing him again, I think I'm ready for some bacon epicenter under King. Not to that level, of course. But he's just, the, it, it seems so old. Oh, and I always think of Sonya Spear Range as just a boring talent. Under King is quite a bit more dramatic and fun with increased burrow range by 20% and damage by 100%. But still, I, I want to do something more fun with those levels. Even Subterranean Shield is just old old talents yeah yeah uh, it's we've been getting some really cool thematic impactful talents lately like uh, i want to keep harping on gaslow but they just kind of knocked it out of the park it's just an interesting rework and in Uberak, everything is just it's subtle ways to just do what you're already doing better except for beetle talents beetle talents are the ones that stand out because it's thematic on top of the fact that it's improving a certain capability of the hero, right? Like, how do you make Burrow Charge more interesting? How do you make your shield more interesting? And I do think there's a very cool talent, like Urticating Spines, which makes shield very interesting. But when we look at popularity... From something like CCL, Under King is at 85% pick rate. We've got Epicenter at 71% pick rate. The really weird disconnect I have with taking those talents is that you should never use them. You should never, like, Murden might jump, but he's Murden. He could, you know, he, he, might, he might make it out if he jumps wrongfully. If you burrow charge too much, you're dead. Everyone gets really excited about killing a new Brack, which they should, because that's kind of the, the balance. And I really, I really have come to appreciate the more warding, sitting in a bush, not first to the fight a new Brack that can then, at great range, join that team fight, dramatically interrupt that mosh pit. You know, a, lot, a lot like Johanna does, holding onto her cooldowns to make sure you're countering the enemy. But we invest so heavily in 
not in the skill we don't use, I don't feel like I'm having fun. That makes sense. You know, I think it does. And, and to me, it kind yeah. of plays to my reaction to the changes to his level twenties. I think they're rather tame. It's like, it's level 20. Not only have we been spoiled by pretty damn interesting twenties in, in recent months in patches, um, you're not going to see it every game. There's no guarantee. And so like, I don't know if you want me to get hyped about twenties, it's like, it takes a lot, I think to move the needle in the perception of level mm. 20 talents. Um, and I don't think these do it. I mean, there's so, there's so many roads too. like, what if hardened shield applied to all your beetles? Basically you got invincible beetles. If you invest in that build, that could get quite a bit done, particularly into those Lee Mings and stuff. Yeah, that would, that would you're, be... You're uh, competing with other 20s, right? Like, so, you know, you get to 20 and all your beetles are invincible, but Chromie now has Piercing Sand, so that entire counterplay you were using to get there doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. So it, it's, it's not I, a perfect situation. I, I think it's also worth noting that, like, there's probably a specific, a unique challenge with Anubarak, which is his base kit is already so damn effective. Like, he's a stun mm. factory. And it's like, how much further can you push that before it becomes feel bad? Yeah. Because we've, we've been there before. But it's always, it's always best been through a little too much survivability, usually, with an Uberac, or a little bit too much damage. Uh, it's never been, like, through, I don't know. It's never felt like his talents were getting him there. Blatantly. No, I, I, I agree. It's, it's a lot like our Malganus Tracer kind of situations. You can't buff them in certain ways because once you convert damage to health they're invincible with a new if he survives too much these stuns are too much and you can't give him like a momentum talent because if he's surviving and he's auto attacking he's stunning too much so there's you know there's a thousand ways we could make him just stupid weird like what if he made medieval portals when he burrow charged it left a tunnel that other people could ride through like hey I want to see this character intact. I want to stop calling him the Traitor King for one, because he's bro number one. He's such a nice guy. He loves his buddy Arthas, and we're always putting him down with that damn title. <laughs> I I just don't want to take talents that I don't use. And I think that's why, you know, actually, if I get right down to it, I think that's why there's a lot of bad Anubarax, because you talent into all these things with your charge, and you go, I want to charge now. I talented into it, damn it, and I'm going to charge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's okay as long as it's epicenter i think <laughs> as long as it's epicenter and not under king or oh ep- epicenter is fine i i, I want to get rid of the, I, I like the cooldown reduction i think that um the burrow charge impact area is a problem because you make bad anubrax for the next game if someone's chaining anubrax but that's not a huge issue I, I mean, it, it's, it's, I, don't know, I, th- I, I think it's nice. I like things that kind of change up. Like you were talking about like, oh my God, the Kerrigan is suddenly teleporting. I like the idea, especially on any sort of point control or pit fight map. Oh crap. Uh, when he comes back up, it affects a larger area now all, all of a sudden, you know, much later in the game and forcing that change up. Um, I get where you're sure. coming from. You get too used to it. And then next game reset the one, you don't have it anymore. And suddenly you're missing your, your burrow stuns. But Exactly. I like the shake up. I like the shake up. So, um, on Malthiel, I, I'm just, I'm glad they're looking at Shroud. I'm not like super stoked about these changes, but I'm glad that they're looking at Shroud because it's like, is it a, it, I think it's weird that it, it's like a base ability and we just don't really use it all that often. I really like this direction. I ended up picking it in a tournament this last weekend and. Or an NGS match, I should say, not a whole tournament. But I was solo laning against Johanna. They went both ETC and Johanna on the enemy team. Ooh, yeah. I'd want to mouth into that. Yeah, well, and if I was doing die alone, who cares it's Johanna? And I'm not, when Johanna's double soaking versus me, which, you know, I have Pale Horse, I'm outpacing her a little bit, but, you no, know, she's doing a good job at it. And then also team fights, double frontline. You want to be marking them both. Exactly. Why would I then be like, die alone? Never in a team fight where I need to actually interact with Vala behind that or the Kael'thas behind that or the healer. 
why as you said i want to target both these tanks at the same time die alone had no purpose so throwing shade now doing two percent health which is actually on johanna about 75 damage so it didn't feel great the reduced mana cost was really really nice though with that heavy of a bumper car's front line i was able to cast this over and over and over again i even used it for lane clear to kind of speed me up at times and that mana cost was huge the range was really nice too so it's a good direction. I really like that idea too. I love that Die Alone has this solo lane capability. And then if the solo lane isn't what you expected it to be, you've got Throwing Shade. Maybe Black Harvest would have been more powerful there. But I'd love to see that 2% become not 75 damage. Maybe it just a, a, a touch more. Is Malthiel our new shared love hero? Might be. It's been a while you know? since we've had one, frankly. It's kind of relaxing because you go in, you get a kill, you die horribly, but you're like, I did it, guys. I'll be back in the solo lane when I rest. I think Malthiel yeah. and Bitewing are my highest win rate this season. Nice. Nice. He's, you know, he's got that cleave. He's got double soak. He's a, he's a great, he's a great learn to bruiser hero. And then I retract all that because he's all about positioning. And <laughs> he's if you, kind of, the melee rainer yeah like teach you the yeah, basics good... right thrall isn't the melee rainer he's more like the melee vala he's always changing his position he's running around in circles he's got increased movement speed thrall but is... yeah you need to thrall is weirdly it's like playing a ballerina man <laughs> he's the busy place. there's too much finesse with thrall well and sometimes with thrall the the answer isn't to hit anybody you know, that's when things get weird with Thrall. Like, you're laning against Sonya, so you you movement speed past her to, like, farm the lane, get your stacks, and then run away. Like, run around your solo lane. I, I spend more time circling my solo lane opponent as Thrall than actually fighting them. Like old Nazebo versus Nazebo laning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's strange. It's strange. Um, How are you doing? Are you stacking or, or double soaking? All right, I'll see you later. I'll be farming my talents here. See you at the team fight, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I was happy to see an Allegrissimo buff for Orphea. That was fun. I love yeah. that talent. So by all means, please buff it. Um, Did you but, get back to Orphea? No, with her no. Being so she, popular she, at the moment? You know, dude, it's, you know, I'm really thinking I need to get out of solo lane. So it's, it's up there. It's, that's, that's a potential for sure. Um, but I never really feel like I cracked the the comfort floor with Orphea. Mm. It's uh, I never got to like a muscle memory point with her. She's very intense. Yeah, uh, her throughput is amazing. Yeah, it's it's like I don't know. For me, Orphea is like one of the most fun heroes in the game when your team is on point and like making things easy for you. And if things are not being made easy for you, I think she's one of the most frustrating heroes to play in the game. I can see that. I can see that. Uh, it's it's a lot like Tychus in that way. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a good, that's a good analogy. This is Does kinda... she be a god out there and just mm -hmm. destroy everybody? But second things go wrong, you're exposed, you missed your one chance to get out with a good... Uh, with a good shadow waltz and well game over. Yeah. You really just, you gotta have, you have to have un, unbreakable nerves. Like if things go bad and you take, you like choke for half a second, you're dead on Orphea. You, that half a second of a choke is when you were supposed to hit that ability that saved your life. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Orphea is a bit of a razor's edge hero for me, but, um, and then Lunara was interesting to me because this is a hero you've tried to get me on a few times and I've just, I just keep wandering away from Lunara. I think that she is very powerful in Storm League when heals can go a little wrong. Uh, by the look of it, she has had a little tiny bit of participation in the CCL and it's, it's, it's all one, you know, four games won for her. My biggest difficulty with Lunar in general is actually a, a, a team and, and people factor. I think Rainer is just so damn good at Lunar's job, you should be Rainer. But everyone is so tragically bored of Rainer that they go Lunara. <laughs> and I think that's wrong because I love Rainer. 
I, I think he's fascinating. I love his choice of positioning. I love his survivability. His heroics are fabulous. Lunar is always getting herself into trouble with a, a leap that touches a wall versus Diablo or you know, uh, Thornwood vining wrongfully. You know, she's got lane clear. She's got this objective clear. And that's all very seductive over someone like Rainer who does it at a different pace. A Dude, less thrilling the, pace you know what the thing many. is the most seductive on Lunar to me is her pursuit potential compared to Rainer. Mm. Like being able to complete kills that otherwise would have escaped. Yeah, this is how many times you've been on that Rainer? You're like, no, they just got away. If you were Lunara, they probably would have been dead. Yeah. And that's an easy trap mindset to get into. It's like, well, wait, would the fight have gone as well if you were on Lunara instead of Rainer? And there's all these other factors to consider. But Right, were you creating as much pressure even though it felt better to be Lunara? Mm -hmm. And as a tank, I had less agency control influence on what you were capable of because you're just going to Lunara leap wherever you want and I hope it goes well for you. Yeah. The, it, the game does, it does have its auto attacker problems, interestingly enough. They're, people don't want a Rainer, which makes me sad. Every time we request a player on our Heroes Lounge team pick Rainer, I hear, oh, and oh, I don't want to. Like, no, he's great. Love him. <laughs> great. I, I'll play Rainer. I get excited when it's when it's time to Rainer. The, the, the only so thing about Rainer that drives me nuts is just how drunk the Banshee pilot is. After years of, of Rexaring and having a really nice, snappy, responsive Misha command, boy, when I tell the Banshee to do something, it just like slowly courts corrects and goes where I want. It drives me insane. I can't stand the I way feel, the yeah. Banshee feels. You know, it's it's the it's definitely the tech. It matches the feeling, like you know, a drone with the little fans, and has to be like, "Whoa, slowing down, everybody!" Little rock back and forth. Okay, I'm going over here. It's just it it is frustrating to have that lack of snap mm -hmm. and speed to it. Yeah, boy, I, 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 I would rather have it do half the damage it does and be as responsive as Misha than its current incarnation. <laughs> That's fair. I think that that could be uh, an avenue for it. Let, let, let me see how. Um, I always love when Hyperion's doing well because it means Hyperion playing usually Rainer is so much doing easier. well. It's just usually underpicked. I'm going to bring him up as well. Oh, wow. We've got four Hyperion games in the CCL. All were losses compared Ooh. to the 13 Rainers Raiders at a 61% win rate. Over on Hot Slogs, it is currently the more popular heroic by a decent amount, but it has a lower win rate than Rainers Raider. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Yeah, but yeah, overall, I, so I, I guess what we're saying is Rainers Raiders doesn't need help. <laughs> but I wouldn't mind if it, you know, got a little love. I agree. Yep. But overall, you know, I like the I like the patch. It, 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 me personally, it didn't really come after a lot of my picks, with the exception of Gazlo, and I, it, I get it, <laughs> I get why, why you're you know knocking him down another peg. So, yeah, I'm. I think that this is a fine preparatory patch. We addressed one of Diva's outstanding talents. We lowered down Gazlo. These are first pick opportunities. It didn't mess heavily with the main damages we're seeing at the moment in the game, which is fine. And I don't know if they want to touch that stuff yet with the decision of Medallion coming up and possibly that new hero with the new season in three weeks. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the CCL, man. I mean, we've been, we've been, we've been referencing it all episode. Let's get into it and its influence on Storm League because the influence is here. It's huge. It, I honestly am surprised. I mean, granted, you know, the higher you go, the more tournaments people are watching and stuff, but it dictated the bans. And I would say in many cases, ridiculously. Yeah. Bans right now you, are becoming Chromie, Junkrat, Medivh, and Cassia. Do you want this? If, if, if this segment, if us talking about how CCL has influenced Storm League bans or just drafting in general, would you like how we could boil it down into five seconds? And is it okay if I shout? Go for it. Stop banning Medivh! <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. 
You don't need to do it. You don't need to do it. It's that you you do. Kind of. You're you're playing and you're you you know you're doing a decent amount of five stacking business uh, even in storm league because you practice sometimes. That makes sense. Very good chance you're going into a good five stack. Maybe even if you're as unlucky as I am and constantly hitting five stacks, even though you're not five stacking, maybe you consider it. <laughs> but other than that, like, why? Why, Kai? Why? I am seeing more people play Medivh, but they're terrible. Let them play Medivh. They have no idea what they're doing. And even if they did, the other four people aren't on comms, and they're going to not pay attention to that freaking portal that's getting put down. It doesn't matter. You're wasting a ban. I agree in, yeah, just about every Storm League case outside of you know a name on the enemy side. Medivh has the lowest win rate in the game right now in our home Storm League, of course. And hey, you know, what people are always complaining about stacks and then people, you know, uh, smurfing and all that. And it's still the lowest win rate hero. So I think we can take that as a pretty strong fact. I hate Portal Mastery. That's, that's my big complaint is I hate that Medivhs fly around in their bird form, putting down the first portal and then changing its location when they change their mind a couple seconds later. And then they're always like, you, why is no one using my portals? You all suck. And I'm like, you're constantly laying false portals for me and then changing their locations. <laughs> How am I supposed to know where these things are going to be? <laughs> I hate that talent. <laughs> fair fair i haven't really had this experience myself but that's 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 but he, fine he, he, and i i i do like medivh though in the end i think he's very powerful in the right hands and when you are accustomed to it it takes practice it's not something your brain is suddenly going to register because there's a new hero in the game but what i do like is he functions in a damage role He's still in there. He's doing stuff. He's not that third melee that really throws me for a loop. He's going to, a lot like Gul'dan, he's going to do regular spell damage. And I can kind of count on him to get a pick maybe in the back line. You know, even facilitating something like I'd want out of a Genji or Zeratul in that way. Which I see a lot of Adives who also play Zeratul, so that makes sense. Yeah. yeah His I, damage I, through. My yeah. argument is not that he's not effective. It's just that uh, most players are not effective with Medivh. Sure, it's not something we need to blindly ban, but I understand why, after seeing it work, the level of aggression Garrosh's and Diablo's can get out of a coordinated pick with that is just ridiculous and can enable a lot of cool stuff. The protection, as well, in this age of stun stacking, makes perfect sense for the CCL. If I were to declare my stop banning, I think I'd go, I'd be a little more dramatic, Garrett. I'd oh. go with Cassia. Cassia. Oh, that's, that's going to be unpopular. Yeah, because people have an opinion that is, that is propped up by really good players that Cassia is busted levels of damage. But I don't think we've figured out how to play her again since she lost that overpowered territory. Right now, when we look at CCL, it is a Thunderstroke build. Well... Thunderstroke at level one anyway, and you get inner light with it. But after that, you're kind of doing Surge of Light and War Traveler, and these things don't perfectly line up in our match the pictures brain. And I'm seeing a lot of poorly built or poorly played or very exposed and weak Cassias. Maybe they need that level of support because every time they get CC'd, they lose their armor. So in that world of stun stacking, the team is taking care of Cassie and empowering her to get this, you know, when we look at the top build, 71% win rate in the CCL. But I don't see, I don't see Storm League players being adapted to Cassia. Right, right. And like, it's, she hasn't been at the tip top since she was overtuned. Right. And while she's still on top, you know, when we look at, you know, hot slogs, the win rates have really kind of been normalized for the most part. Like our, our higher end starts kind of at lost Vikings and, and that's like number five. And then you've got Kerrigan, Diva, Uther, Gazlo above that. And those are kind of on the high end of the win rates from that down. Like the, you know, it's 
54% and really tightly c- controlled there in terms of, uh, hold on, I'm talking, I'm talking about the delta between win rates here. Um, you know, and while Cassie is still really high up, you know, she's, she's still below, like she's at the higher end of a close to a 50% win rate. So yeah, you can look at those, those CCL win rates, but that's not what you're going to experience in your home games. Well, and are we building Cassio wrong at home still? Is is the have we updated the wider range of Cassio players to have that play style? And I don't think we have. Because it when I see these in CCL, it's a lot of pure damage, which I love as tank. I love just noisy laser beams everywhere. So everybody on the enemy team is getting scared, taking tons of damage, and Zeratul or whoever it is gonna be is going to get that chance to clean up. Cassie is supplying that. And when we look at our other top picks and other things that are being banned in Storm League, they're supplying that too. We have to remember though, we have to take that step back and realize that they're making those three melee comps. They need what we previously ran in HGC days, that Vala and Gazlo. But now that Vala and Gazlo's role is being covered by Cassia, Junkrat, and Chromie. And getting that level of damage out of those three characters is not as easy as the Vala Greymane was. It's not as clean or obvious. Well, you're getting into the territory of the more obvious kind of distinction we make from coordinated to pick up gameplay, right? Which is just the, the more control over the team fight that you have in coordinated play and the more empowering that is to damage dealing heroes. Perhaps, right? And then someone like Junkrat Chromie can aim their shots, be in those positions that get that huge amount of damage out in the first place. It can be very tough for Storm League teams to know what to target, particularly when you have wind-ups like Chromie does, or right. a, a Junkrat who is playing different styles, more focused on lane clear than you may have expected, which is also a fine aspect of Junkrat, but you know when you make these lesser damage comps and he needs to carry the whole business of damage, it can be very detrimental to have Junkrat focused on lane clear. But I do agree that that we're we're past our drama picks. I do agree that Chromie in particular deserves a ban right now. Mm, Okay. I think she is a lot, a lot of pure damage to bring to a team. And in that way, enables a lot of teams to be able to do things and pull off comps that would otherwise be bad. Now, in our home games, we're looking at a 50% win rate, but there's a lot of exposed chromies out there getting in weird positions, overstepping. Uh, I I don't know what differentiates them, honestly. What makes a good chromie and a bad chromie? uh, uh, Probably if you were right or wrong with that extension that you made. (laughs) If if you're putting yourself in an exposed area, like was the right call versus not, you know, are, are you getting caught? And I, I mean, obviously accuracy what? is going to be a big part of it, but, but beyond that game, just game awareness, knowing when you can safely put yourself in those positions. I can tell you actually by playing alongside a Chromie in my heroes lounge team, the biggest aspect that empowers a Chromie as a team is playing around the slowing sands. When you run away, you run through the slowing sands. When you fight, you fight on the slowing sands. And I've never once, I've heard hammers nonstop. Fight in my circles. No no one's ever in range of me, you know? But I've never once had a Chromie lose their cookies about me not fighting in a slowing sand. Maybe they should. Maybe that's the big differentiation. Well, it's like yelling fight on the objective, except you have an objective you can put wherever the hell you want it. And to an extent, yeah. And maybe, so. of course, the slowing sands aren't in the right place. They're not in a useful place. There's all sort of you know problems like that that could arise. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of X factors. But I mean, there's so much about what we've been seeing in CCL. The other one I haven't mentioned is just vision. I mean, the, the casters have been making a really big deal about vision in in coordinated play and that's something that the, the players clearly value and is going to empower a Chromie. On the Junkrat side of things, I think the build has been pretty well established for a long time. The play style 
for most people across the leagues is don't sit on your bombs. Just keep, keep casting, keep casting, which isn't particularly hard to do. I just don't think there's enough junk rats in the world to warrant the pick or the ban mm. in that case. Back to the Cassia Chromie scenario. It's in- interesting. You should mention that. Um, do you think that it's more likely that more people play Chromie than Cassia? I would say so. They're right next to each other on popularity on hot slots. What percent? Uh, Cassie is at 24% and Chromie is at 23.6%. Okay. I mean, that definitely outweighs our 2.5% Medivh, our uh, 5% Junkrat. And I, I'm also going to bring up a, a character that is often called overpowered, but sees very little play, Maev. Yeah, that is not one I would want to ban. I think the chances are too great uh, that they don't, that no one on the opposing team even plays my have in the first place. Yeah. I mean, she's definitely one of those heroes where I'm like, ooh, like if I had a year, <laughs> if I could do the time capsule, just smurf for a year, whatever, she would be definitely near the top of my list. Yeah. Yeah. Likelihood that someone plays it is a big factor for me when I want to, when I think about what I want banned. Um, and the whole time you were talking about Cassie and Chromie, I was like, I don't know that, that, that between the two, I think there's good, good, good arguments for both. And then looking at how frequently they're picked and banned kind of works out. However, the people agree with you, Kyle, Chromie is banned way more often. I think that is still a good band to put out there. Uh, then their dedicated player base. She has a lot of range. It's not impossible to get good at her either. So I'd say let's ban Chromie influenced by the CCL. I think Cassia might be worth it depending on where you are in league, the higher you go right now. Of course we have lingering bans on diva and Gazlo, And I think those are perfectly healthy. They are early picks. Yes, I agree. And I know Diva is. Are you seeing Gazlo in coordinated play? I, I was actually the Gazlo a number of times this week. Okay. All right, cool. So then, yeah, just keep those even if you're five stacking in Storm League. It's probably a, still a relatively safe bet. Um, for the future, I would keep your eye on Junkrat. I'm right now, not popular, but we've definitely gone through like the season of the Junkrat. And if he keeps popping up in CCL, I could see that moving the needle. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about supports. Okay. Because we, cert- we certainly alluded to it over the past couple of weeks, but with our various BBJs and whatnot, showing off what Brightwing can do in a post-medallion world, Brightwing has become the tippy-tippy top of popularity. Always was extremely popular, but now has the power in our current meta to back it up. After that, you're looking at Stukov. Not in popularity so much, but certainly in the CCL, of people just slamming that character that can deal with the medallions. And then we go into what you would expect out of tournament play, Ana. Everything else after that, Phil's, maybe Uther's, because things are getting very coordinated, weird over there. A couple of Deckers, as you would expect. And things like Ka- Kairazim doing their Kairazim business here and there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unlike the top bands, I don't think this needs much explanation. This makes all the sense in the world to me. Yeah. It's like, if, it's a nice we spread, were, right? Like you have Brightwing, Stukov for Medallion, Ana for just top tier play. To, yeah, to Ana, to, to Nano Boost in. Uh, we also see a lot of Deckers and they're winning at 75% in the CCL. So he's doing great out there. A great general be, healer. That seems, to, to me, it looks like, you know, I haven't seen every single CCL game. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me like that's one of the rare, more map dependent picks because I'm seeing them on pit fight maps a lot. And it makes sense. You want to litter it with potions. And also, I mean, ex- you get more value out of his his uh, area control. So, in terms of popularity and- to win rate, Deckard is at the top, but we're definitely seeing more Anna's Brightwings and Stukovs. So, I, I agree with you for the map pick there. Yeah, I think I think your Brightwings, your your Stukovs, your Anna's, they fit more often. So that makes sense. What about if you're interested? Yeah. In odd solo tanks. There mm. was a game this past week with a Leoric solo tank. That sounds like the most stressful experience of my life. 
<laughs> well, maybe, maybe not a, a necessarily solo, but Lyric has been taking up some off tank duties here and there. And it's okay. It's not Imperius. And Imperius is absolutely the bruiser to cruise with. Should you be looking for a bruise cruise solo tank? Good phrase. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, boy, one New York game, I think, does not a trend make. But No, no. But it is, it is an interesting selection, of course. What game was that? Uh, I did not see that one. Do you know offhand? I don't know off the top of my head. I, I feel like it was a Infernal Shrines, but that had an Anubarak in it as well. So he, my he's own. making the rounds. Keep my on chat in case they bring it up. Nothing so far. All right. I want to watch that. Someone let me know. Tweet at me at Garrett Hart. <laughs> <laughs> and then Out. the three melee, Kyle. You mentioned Yes. It. Yes. And uh, we've, of course, alluded it, to it here with Arvala gray main talk being the old moldy busted. Nobody wants them as that solo DPS. We talked about Cassia Chromie filling this role as well as Junkrat. The other two characters, if you are curious about running these kinds of comps are going to be Hanzo tracer and Tychus. The idea of tracer filling this role fills me with horror and regret because <laughs> <laughs> that's how I feel about Hanzo. I mean, I see it, right? Like, Hanzo can get a lot of raw damage. That can make sense in my brain. Yep. I see Tracer. You get the stun stack going. The Tracer zips ups and ends and does the bomb thing, and that target's dead. Tychus, another one with great, great, encouraged by lockdown and a strong front line, deletion potential. But yes, in our own home games, I don't really want to see this. I'm not prepared for it as a tank is probably the greatest barrier to this functioning in storm lake you may not have a prepared support either but that's going to be more reactionary than the tank's role in this sort of job and your double bruisers or at least bruiser melee has to be so on point with their cc's that go into the tank or vice versa the tank cc's and then you follow up that to get Hanzo, for instance, to get out that damage output is going to be a tall order. Yeah. I'm, I'm concerned as someone who's window shopping for, for damage to move on to from solo laning of basically all of these becoming kind of the meta. They're so out of my wheelhouse. They're very particular. There isn't a hero on there that I feel maybe flows into each other outside of Junkrat Chromie? Because you're kind of like a mini summoner and you got your little busy, busy fort setting up you do it and then you spam forward and you know, relocate or slow some people, trap them down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Soph in chat room has let us know that the solo, Lior solo tank Lior game was a game one of Granite versus Wild Heart on Shrines. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, looks. Oh, yeah, look at... Well, I guess technically there was a blaze here. Yeah, but... So he's, he, he's uh, being... If, it, if Corny is correct, the blaze was double soaking. Yeah, so, so that's how we kind of can make that differentiation. It's not so much that there wasn't another warrior tank available. It was who was doing the other job, and Leoric was the one hanging out in the four stack. Yeah, maybe he's called, maybe main tank and not solo tank, I guess. Interestingly enough, they picked a Deathwing here too. So maybe maybe a little bit of, oh, they've got a Deathwing. Well, we're going to main tank Leoric in order to deal with that. Deathwing is ruining my my games right now. <laughs> he's in a lot of places. Yeah. He's he's a bit he's a busy guy. He's, I, he's I think foiling that... my Gazlo bomb uh, Gravos. Just not not getting the value I'm used to them getting. He's he's trouble. Yeah, so it looks like this. Yeah, so what we had here was a Gazlo Junkrat Blaze Stukov and the enemy team goes for that grab on a Deathwing as the game advances. So with the final pick, Pit Kid grabbed a Leoric. Interesting. I, I, I see why they would pull it off and I, I, they won that one, I believe. Let's see. Yep, yep, they won it. I'm going to rather handily I'm by the look of it. Going to go out of my way and find that game and watch it. Yeah. 
That sounds interesting. So I'll put a link in the show notes for everybody. So we talked a lot about what you shouldn't take away from CCL. What do you think you should? I think it's worth investing in these right wing Stukovs at the moment. I think that's absolutely correct. I think revisiting Cassie, if you like her, is a good idea. If you can unlock that potential. Chromie Junkrat uh, as well. Same with Chromie and Junkrat. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I do think in terms of like Storm League draftability, if you are solo lane, you have to know Gazlo and Diva right now. It's not so much their power, which they do have really good win rates, but it's really about that no one wants to pick early in the other roles. And when a bruiser who traditionally wants to pick so late is powerful enough to be early picked, it just frees up the draft so much. It gets rid of that late game clutter. The most last picked here in this game right now is Muradin. And I believe it because you go into those low leagues and you're going to see a lot of people who don't want to tank, who waited around to the end. And that's, that's not necessarily the tank I'd want to see in that situation, nor would I, but I get he, he basically, to a lot of people, he plays like a, a big assassin. And if you're assassinating on Muradin, you're, you're kind of tanking in the first place because you killed somebody and you not, don't have to tank anymore. So <laughs> I get why it happens. There's a translation. You know, you don't just say, whoa, oh man, I was going to play. No, I was going to do camps all day on Sonya. Let me ETC. It's such a different role. Such a different idea. I did. But, but everybody wants to last pick a lot of the time. It, it, I know it's ridiculous to say because so many people talk about, you know, slam picks as the draft first comes up. But those, that Genji, that Vala, whoever it is that you're seeing all the time slam pick first, they would be way better suited just taking a moment waiting for later. And Gazlo and Diva with their survivability and just general disruption still absolutely rock that place. I think too, I don't really want to is my problem. But there's something about this main tank, Imperius, that is absurdly snappy and is performing the role better than many of our other tanks, uh, including things like May. Not in win rate, of course, but in readability to your team into what they should be targeting. Mm. Yeah. I, uh, my takeaway is like, I want to just play more Brightwing, but I don't want to heal if I don't get the Brightwing. <laughs> so that's my weird CCL takeaway. It's like, oh yeah, I love this here. I want to play more of her. Well, that's a, I mean, that's an interesting concept. And it's something that I've been toying around with myself uh, yeah, on the edge of masters repeatedly over the last couple seasons. And such a Diablo main as, as much as I try. And for my teams, I certainly work on my Johan and my ETC and, you know, regrettably Amalganis that I still love. I, when I lose Diablo, I'm just not as good as I was going to be. And I'm seriously debating taking away my roles and just switching. And I don't want to be that guy. But like you just said, like you, you want to heal on Brightwing. If, if you don't get Brightwing, you don't want to heal. That, I think that's, that's fine. I think you probably have a better win rate if you followed that passion. If I went, oh, didn't get Diablo, guys, I'm Rainer. My win rate would probably be better. Yeah. But I'm, I'm horrified. And, and playing in teams has, has further cemented that a roll is a roll is a roll. And you are going to do your damn roll. Regardless of where the the bands go. They could ban six tanks. You're still going to pick a darn tank. You better have one you still like somewhere. <laughs> but in Storm League, when there's so much noise, so much randomness, I really am debating just being like, hey, didn't get Diablo, I'm not tanking. I'm something else now. Someone else, please get this roll. How many times have people done it to you, man? <laughs> Quite a few. But I, I too accuse them of being a roll swapper. Dirty, the switch in a ruin. In like, you know, uh, oh, I didn't get murdered. I'm Gul'dan now. My brain goes, how are those related? What, what, what is wrong with you that you would send us all on that journey, that loop? 
Well, and that's what I think of because that's something you've you've preached a, a billion times on this podcast. You are a voice in the back of my head when I show a pick. In the back of my head, I go, well, if this, if this gets banned or taken, I better have a good storyline, an arc on my next pick. Better stay in universe on this. <laughs> stay yeah, on brand. I, 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 think it's, I think it's a healthy practice to have. We're not, we're, we're not going from pho to pizza, all right? We're staying within the hot noodle territory. <laughs> uh, it's interesting, Kyle. Interesting thoughts. But, dude, it's kind of... It's, it's exciting, man. It is exciting to have competitive heroes back in the spotlight. It is exciting to have the community as a whole watching the same thing again. Yeah. You know, and I'm not trying to take away from other, other tournaments because there, there have been tournaments the whole time. The grassroots scene hasn't died, but Heroes Hearth did a really good job of, of building this up, hyping it up, getting the talent behind it, getting you know sponsors and whatnot behind it to where it feels like HGC again to me. It feels like all of my Heroes of the Storm friends are watching the same thing again. And it is such a cool feeling to have. The gravitas it gives and what they've pulled off by getting so many names together. And not only those that were drafted, the ones that they got in as coach, as coaches, as scrim partners, has given everybody one goal to be a part of the CCL. And it, it, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous thing out there because a lot, of, a lot of players who didn't get in the CCL are experimenting in Storm League and tra- changing their roles. So you'll be like, oh, damn, I got so-and-so. Whoa, yeah, we're going to rock this. And they're like, by the way, guys, I'm working on my assassin today. You're like, No. No, you're you're a main HGC tank. Would you? I want you to. I want you to tank, please. And like, nah, no, nah, not really. I don't feel like it. <laughs> but they too need to. They need to grow their rosters too, because they want to be picked up by teams. And if there's no roles in the tank roles for them, then they need to find other avenues to participate. Yeah. Well, awesome, man. Well, I think that brings us to an end of this episode. What do you think? I think that's a healthy place to stop. Yeah. Uh, folks, if you want to write in, itncast at gmail.com is the place to do so. We knew we were going to go a little long today, but uh, keep writing in. If you are a patron, you can drop us a message directly in the patron Discord. You can skip the inbox entirely. Uh, and speaking of our patrons, thank you so much for the support, everyone. We really appreciate it. And uh, if you want to go and become a patron, check it out, patreon.com slash itn. Huge thanks, by the way, to our producers, Declan H., Cheesy Bob, Chris K., Mike C., and Sean B. Thank you so much for the support. And... Uh, other than that, you can find the show and others like it over at amove.tv. You can follow the show on Twitter at ITNCast, and you can join us live Thursdays over on twitch.tv slash amovetv. Come join us. Hang out with our chat room. Make some friends. They're fine people. They're fine people. Most of them. You know who you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting trolled about my ETC win rate in there. Uh, it's, uh, but, no, now I feel just... extra bad for trolling your ETC uh, earlier but, this week. They have gotten us links to CCL games that we were wondering about. So they are very helpful people. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for that, everybody. But before we go, Kyle, this is not the only place you are making fine, wonderful content. Where can everyone find you? You should certainly check out the videos I'm making over at Heroes Hearth, youtube.com slash Heroes Hearth. Interviewed, unaverted on his Nazebo this last week. Awesome insightful Nazebo play with a very interesting build you may have not considered all about survivability. It's not the pretty pictures one. So check that out over there. Also check out kyleferguson.com for everything I do, including the DM Gives Inspiration show. New season starting up very soon. Season 7, I believe. Oh my goodness. Of that D&D Dungeon Master Advice show. Sick. Everyone should go check that show out. You're doing awesome work over there man thank you uh folks i'm garrett art on twitter uh amove.tv for all of the podcasts let's talk about star wars is back because the mandalorian is back have you been watching kyle i have not but we stockpile them i I don't have Ah. the patience for week to week stuff Ah. Ah. ah it's so much fun to yell and nerd out with everyone week to week Uh, you know i don't need i don't need the water cooler i've got uh got stuff to do Mm, fair no I, the, 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 you know what yeah that's that's actually wrong because i'm totally watching ccl enjoying that water cooler so i just put my water cooler energy in other places yeah 
Yeah. Well, anyways, go find Let's Talk About Star Wars wherever it is you get your podcast. Wow Killer is also back that because of Taliesin and my schedule. Uh, if anything's even a little bit off, that thing gets pushed a week. And I was gone, and the week before that, Taliesin had something pop up. So uh, turns out time zones uh, from the U.S. to to uh, to England. It's a little, little difficult, but Wow Killer just put out a brand new episode talking all about uh, major character deaths in World of Warcraft because uh, no reason. There definitely wasn't a major character death this past Tuesday. Was there? There was. There was. I'm being cool. Oh. I'm being cool. Oh, because it's like a spoiler. Yeah, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, but you've right, you have to tell me after the show who, who kicked the bucket. Yeah, I'll let you. I'll let you. It won't matter because the next expansion we're going to where all the dead people go. But oh, yeah. so yeah, so, but you know, <laughs> you might be in. You might they might be in the mall or something, which is like extra super special dead. But I'm well, sure we'll go there. wise, anyway. that's where they're all going. That's actually the problem because they're not supposed to go oh. to the mall. Oh, I see. Yeah, you're supposed to have one final chance for redemption, and then if you don't redeem yourself in death, then off to the mall with you. But everyone's just going directly ah. to the mall, Kyle. That's the problem. Why are they I going see, directly to the mall? Ah, why, Kyle? You won't know because you're not playing. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I do not know. I'll tell you in an outro of Into the Nexus at some point. That's that's how you'll Sounds find good. out. You live vicariously through Into the Nexus outros promoting Wild Killer. It'll be good. <laughs> it's the best way. It is the best way to experience World of Warcraft. I promise. I promise. So anyway, check it out. And obviously, Hearthstone is on fire. So go check out the Anger Chicken. That's gonna wrap it up for this episode of Into the Nexus. Until next time. Good luck and have fun. Take care.